SmackDown for January the 12th. They were in Lincoln, Nebraska. That was one of Ric Flair's better towns. I'll just leave it at that. But out comes, first thing you see, Grayson Waller in that ridiculous costuming that he, someone believes is flattering for him or heat. Get It gets heat with me. I'm not sure it gets the right kind of heat, but whatever he's wearing. And he's got Austin Theory with him. My boy, Austin Theory, what have they done to him? They've paired him with what may be WWE's version of our little dog pockets. This grace, I don't know. It on any measure of the scale. Well, we'll talk about it later on when when theory is out there. But uh, I do have to have issue a correction. I, I do when I've made a mistake, when I've offended people, I do, you know, you know, apologize. And apparently a lot of people have been offended by me continuing to call Kevin Patrick the English guy. And they have written, say, he's not fucking English, he's Irish. I'm not sure I'm doing the accent right, but apparently he's Irish. So we have them to blame. <laughs> but I apologize to my friends in, uh, in merry old England. They did a package from last week, the triple threat match where Roman and company came out and slaughtered all the top baby faces. And then they had a, a clip from after, supposedly in the back, where, you know, Paul told Roman about the four-way being made by Nick Aldis for the title with him against the top three baby faces, and Roman says, fix it. Right? That was last week. So now we're supposed to see Grayson Waller against Cameron Grimes, but we come out of that package and Solo and Jimmy Uso are beating up Grimes in the aisleway and the security guys. And Waller and Theory just bail out so they don't get any. And that's where Heyman takes the microphone. And this was a Heyman heavy show, which actually isn't a bad thing. No, not at all. Get. Yeah. And he said, We're not the bad guys. This James Bond wannabe Nick Aldis is the bad guy. He made the four way to guarantee that Roman loses the title. See, now they're trying to say, Okay, this is going to be the chink in his armor. <laughs> right. This is the weakness of the unbeatable. Three guys are going to beat him. But anyway, that makes Aldis the bad guy. And then Aldis takes the microphone, and, and we, you and I have talked about this. He's, I mentioned last week I didn't like him being so calm and cool and collected while three of the most valuable members of his roster were being slaughtered in front of his face. But I like the idea that he's the snooty, fucking hard-nosed, you know, the, I'm the general manager and I want to get over for me. I'm selfish. This is all about me, me, and I'm not going to brook any of your interference, Heyman. And he says, this is not a talk between equals to Heyman. Like, I'm your boss, motherfucker. The yes. four-way is set and the bloodline aren't going to ruin another main event tonight because they're in it. And he books AJ and L.A., an R.O. against Solo and Uso and Romano, Roman Reigns. And Paul tries to answer him by taking the microphone, and Aldous won't let go of it. That was great. <laughs> it that was, was just, great. Yeah. He, he's in control of the show here. Paul says, Roman's not here. And Aldous says, you're right. So find a third guy if you like, or it's two on three. Yeah, and the I, best part was they got this all done in 10 minutes. It was great. Go ahead. No, they did. And I was saying this to you before, but I, I love what they're doing with all this. I wasn't sure in the beginning. I had the reaction a lot of people did, which is, well, they're kind of wasting this guy. What, what is this? You know, he's a wrestler. He's, he's accomplished. Uh, but he's really they're doing something very different. It's we've talked about how the authority figure thing is so <laughs> completely done to death. And, and usually they're either evil or they're completely ineffectual. I mean, I like Adam Pierce, but his whole job was just to just yell and, and <laughs> exasperatedly wave his arms around while he's nobody... The he's the nice guy who's trying right. to keep this, you know, uh, this uh, troubled student class in, yeah. you know, in line, whereas Aldous is a cutthroat evil businessman out for himself and not any particular side of the wrestling roster. But but he's not, they're not doing the evil thing where he's like one of the McMahons. Like, it's, right. it's not that right. kind of a thing. It's like, he is 
in charge and he's going to make it clear I run this show and I'm going to do what's best for this show. And I think it's cool to have a character like that because we've always talked about how lame it comes across sometimes when they try to act like the wrestlers run the show. Because, look, we all know the wrestlers don't run the show, so it comes across as uh, really just annoying when the wrestlers are just running everything and, and no authority figures can control anybody. And with Nick Aldis, it seems like he's there in storyline. He represents the company. He represents WWE. We run the show. You're going to do what we want you to do. And not even Roman Reigns is above that. And I think doing that, it keeps Roman Reigns fresh and it keeps the bloodline as fresh as it could be because they were you know, definitely becoming stale because now they have this new wrinkle where now they have a boss who is not going to just kowtow to whatever they want. But I think you'll find out over a period of time, and I'm pretty sure Aldous will be in this spot for a while. You'll find out over a period of time, Aldous wants to run the fucking WWE. Yeah. And as soon as he's, he's not evil, like I'm a madman and I want all the heels to win. He's like, I'm going to run this whole fucking thing. I think this could be very interesting. Yeah, and I hope it leads to him actually getting in the ring and working a program. I mean, I may, I may sound ridiculous and maybe I'm totally off base here, but I could, I could potentially even see this leading to his eventually challenging Roman Reigns himself. You're not only off base, you're not even in the ballpark. <laughs> Tell me why. I, I guarantee you, you may see Aldous do physical things and you may even see Aldous put into... A match, a la Vince was put in matches or whatever. I don't think you will ever see Aldous wrestle uh, with any regularity or for any other reason than a premium live event after a long, long period of time. He knows that he's closer to the end than the beginning on his wrestling career, but he's got a whole new thing that he's found here and that they found in him. And if they don't, you know, just uh, they should lean away from the fact that he's been a wrestler rather than lean into it, except in terms of him putting the foot down because physically he's, you know, big enough to stand out eye, eye with people. But boy, they ought to wait and make the people pay it. It's something it's, it's Austin and McMahon. Yes. Yeah, you know, I can it's, see it's that. not, you know, Vince is going to be wrestling on Raw this Monday. <laughs> what the fuck? No. <laughs> it, right. You know, right. So. I think they're going to lean into that aspect of it. I don't want, I don't think he should want to be just, not just a wrestler, but I don't think he would want to wrestle with enough regularity that it would not be special for a long, long time. But I think and for then, the... And then, you know, at the same time, then he can be presented as a retired wrestler, but he wouldn't be on the same level as currently active, you know, competitor. Yeah, and we know, uh, obviously, Adam Pierce also had a wrestling background, but I know Adam Pierce has been very public in saying that he never wants to wrestle again. But in the case of somebody like Aldis, you know, the average WWE fan, they have no idea what his background is. They don't know if he ever wrestled before. And I think, like you said, even if it's a special one-time only or a very rare thing, the idea of, and once he shows the people what he can actually do, I think a lot of WWE fans will be really surprised because they don't really see him that way. I don't know whether they should be surprised. Think about this. 25 times more people are seeing him now than have seen him before. Should he show him he's a great wrestler? Depends. It depends on whether he's against a baby face or a heel and what he's fighting for. Should he show him he's a great wrestler or should he be in a position where they're finally going to get this motherfucker's ass kicked and I want to see it? it, just, it we'll, we'll see how far it takes him to get there. But I would, I would not want to see him in tights for months and months. This is right. just getting started. Right. Speaking of people, I don't want to see in tights for months and months. <laughs> the, the tag team match between the LWO and Angel and Herbert. I'm going to make one comment on it. They showed a picture, uh, the graphic of all four of them. Match coming up next, going to the break, and... Besides the fact that one guy has a full beard, otherwise all four of those pictures could have been the same fucking guy. This is these guys are the same size, they have the same color hair, they're, they're the same style of wrestling, uh, and they look the yeah. same. And fast forward, 
it's it's a problem across I, I mean AEW is even worse with it where there's just the they don't make enough of an effort or at least what the effort that they used to make to really visually differentiate people. You know, there's a lot of similarity in the presentation of a lot of wrestlers today. Well, but you know what? I mean, before all it took was at Gorilla, there would be the sign, no matching tights, which means yes. if you're wearing fucking red and your opponent's wearing red, somebody go fucking change. And otherwise, everybody looked different. Everybody on the roster looked and was different shape, different features, different gimmick, different obvious visually. And we got a bunch of people in a certain size range and a certain method of wrestling these days and just about everywhere. But nevertheless, they started a show-long journey now for a, a quest for Heyman to try to find the third partner for their sixth man for the main event because they go to the back and Uso's freaking out. Oh, shit, who are we going to get in? Paul's like, hey... I'm going to find somebody, all these people kissing my ass, trying to join the bloodline. Don't worry. And Uso says, well, I am worried. And they look at Solo, and Solo says, I never worry. So now that's what this is going to be, you know, throughout the night is Heyman's trying to find the partner. But then they go back to Nick Aldis. And he's there with Carmelo Hayes in his office, and Nick's putting him over. Yeah, well, you know. And just when Carmelo Hayes gets to start to ask about the rumble, here comes Waller and Theory. And they barge in and argue into a match with Theory tonight against fucking Carmelo Hayes, which, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, will lead to no good. And then we go back to Heyman. And he comes up to Carlito and his group of friends Zelina and the other people and Paul offered and this was because nobody is you know nobody is a better smarmy con man talk out of both sides of his neck as JYD would say person than Paul Heyman and he's got an apple which he polishes and gives to Carlito <laughs> and so you know you want to you could come and be the partner to blah 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 and old Carlito takes the apple and blows him off. But how great is Heyman in this shit? Yeah, he's he's great in this kind of stuff, and I love when they give him this kind of thing to do. It's incredible to me that after all these years, you would think that it would get that people would get tired of it or that it would get. But he's always, he always finds a way to keep it interesting. His reactions to things. I mean, even just at ringside when sometimes and maybe i shouldn't be doing this but sometimes i'll be watching him instead of the match just to see his reaction yeah every little thing that happens you know he'll react like it's the end of the world which is great well anyway point being um you know so far his first his first uh effort to find somebody has led to no good so now they actually had, and maybe you can explain this to me. You've sat in on some of those production meetings. You've known some of these, the, the, the writers of the actual sketches that they do. Why did they have Butch and Tyler Bate have this phony conversation in a fake coffee shop about meditation and British strong style. You said you watched things very closely. Can you explain this conversation to me? <laughs> I did, and I watched this particular segment very closely, too. Uh, this is an example of the kind of thing that I, I've said before, too. I know you guys have said that I don't have much use for on these shows, and it's not the fault of the talent. I actually, I, I don't, it was like I was watching a scene in train spotting or something. That's what it felt like to me. But then I started thinking, okay, so we've got these two guys. They're in, I guess, a coffee shop and they're having this heart to heart, in depth conversation about in front life. Of a, in front of a video camera, right? On national a, television. Multi camera. So you got multi camera shoot. You've got the, you've got the wide shot, whatever they call it, the main shot. Then you've got one camera on Butch, one camera on, on Tyler Bate. And, they're just supposed to be just they're kind of uh, rekindling their friendship. And it, that kind of stuff just never works for me. And if I have to say, believe it or not, it's one thing that I think AEW at least tries, tries to do differently than WWE is that when they do these backstage things, 
they always at least try to explain why there's a camera there. Whereas WWE just gave up. It's just you are just watching a television show and there's no apologies made for it. And that's it. And and on AEW, they they give you a reason to have the camera there. They just don't give you a reason why that the guy on camera can't see the 10 feet off camera. The three people coming to beat the shit out of him are standing right there. Right. You know why the camera but one there. one gripe at a time. Yeah. You just don't know why the wrestlers are there in front of the camera, but that's different. Uh, yeah, yeah. So then Bianca. Bianca fought Bailey and Bianca won. You have yes. any thoughts on it? <laughs> that is true. That occurred. That is true. Um, well, good. I was saying before how I think that, um, you know, SmackDown, they'll do these things on there where they give you a great match. And, and there's no, I have no, nothing really to complain about it, but it just feels like they just go too long. And maybe it's because they're, they have a lot of time to fill. Maybe it's because I get spoiled watching old TV wrestling where the matches all have 10-minute time limits. I don't know what it is. I don't know if my attention span is shortening as I get older, but after a while, it just becomes, I don't know, you have two very talented wrestlers in there. They're great. I, I like Bailey. I, I love Bianca Belair. She's incredibly athletic. Uh, I thought they did a fine job. It's just, couldn't we have done this in half the time that they did it in? Well, here's the thing. Brian Last and I have discussed this quite a bit, and with all the WWE programs, especially Raw because it's three hours, but even with SmackDown, you know that except for the main event potentially and whatever's going to happen, that they present the matches as, okay, these are the kind of blasé people. They're going to have a match now, but coming up is the big stars are going to talk to you. And that's the thing. I said at the top of the program, I teased it. I sort of see it's an astronomy show, the difference between stars and black holes. The WWE is running away with this thing by showing them star after star after star and making new stars and elevating people. And all they have to do is fucking talk to you. And then they just said, let me talk to you. And then they just put some of these fucking matches in to fill time in between people talking to you. Whereas in AEW, Nobody is, they've lost their major stars to injury or ineptitude. And most of the people on the roster are not as over as they once were. And they are wrestling you to death. And it's all watching car wreck highlights over and over and over again. And nobody stands out. There's no clear stories and they're not elevating people. They're de-escalating them. See that you, you WWE is boring us to death by having stars talk to us and the people are eating it up. And AEW is killing their roster and not even softly with this song, but with brain damage and fucking spinal injuries by giving us nothing but car wrecks that hey, look all the same and nobody gives a shit anymore. That's where this whole thing is going. Well, one thing I one thing I'll say about the match though that that I do, I do think would be fair to point out, you know, people talk about the women's division in AEW and being a mess, and it is, and they've trained their fans into not caring about it. I mean, I was at World's End, and I mean, that is a fact. I mean, people just, for be for whether they're right or wrong, that is sort of the time when everybody just checks out. And that that's not the case with WWE, if you notice. Like, people really see these women as stars. They they perceive this oh, yeah. as a big no, deal. It, it, and that is to their credit that they've done that. They have made people care about women's wrestling. Now, compared to the LWO against Angel and Herbert, this yes. was a main event in any arena in the country, but I have a limited amount of time. <laughs> but then uh, talking about talking... They had earlier in the night, they had had Logan Paul had cut a promo on Kevin Owens that he, that cast that he's wearing is illegal and I may sue or what, it, it, old time heel shit. And then Owens does a promo about Logan, Logan Paul said the broken hand and the cast isn't an advantage. And I want to talk to him face to face next week. On the Kevin Owens show. So they're going to have Logan Paul international star and man of crypto coin and fucking big mouth Owens talk to us next week. And, and that's what they did. And then here came Bobby Lashley and the street profits. And guess what they were going to do to us, Solomon Grundy. They were going to talk to us. Let me talk to you. 
But now here is 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 where the 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 segment the talking died. Because I'm going to describe what I saw, Brian. Tell me if you disagree or if for some reason you think maybe there was a, a some kind of chloroform leak from the hospital next door that put the fans to sleep. <laughs> it was piped through the air ducts and put everybody in a state of suspended animation. Maybe the cordyceps. To, but anyway, Lashley and the Street Profits come out and talking about being attacked by the AOP and uh, Killer Cro Carrion Cross and Paul Ellering and Scarlet and last week. And I love Bobby Lashley, but I've said his promos are not his strong suit. He needs more conviction in his voice. He really is. I mean, he's the most badass <laughs> the MMA fighter on the fucking planet. And what a beast of an athlete, but he really is a nice guy and a soft-spoken guy. But it, he says the right stuff. We're not cowards. We confront people face to face and fight, but it needs to have more oomph in this day and age. And he's the one that's got to carry the the legitimacy for the other two because when they've had promos to pass, all they've done is just, I don't know, comedy at each other, whatever the fuck they were doing. But now they're they're calling the heels out that beat him up last week and nobody's reacting. And then the... The lights dim, and there's Paul Ellering in the entrance, and it looks like somebody went to film school is figuring this out. He's in darkness, but he you can see him, but he turns and grandiosely points. Is that a word with grandiosity? Yes, it points is. to the screen. And on the screen, there's Carrie and Cross and Scarlet doing their spooky stuff where they recite some shit. And they're putting Occam and Razor over. And now their group is called the Final Testament. And the video ends, and the fans are sitting and staring, and Lashley and the Street Prophets are standing in the ring with their proverbial dicks in their hands. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is not an example of WWE at their best. I mean, they're good at making people care about things. As we've said, they're better than AEW at that, but they have not gotten the people to care about this. And I don't know how, why, or well, I mean, I do know why to a certain degree, but it's not, it's just not working. They had MVP with Lashley. We know why, because MVP is a great talker. He's not with them anymore. And this whole, they're just not buying into, I just don't feel, you could feel watching that segment. Like you said, there was no energy. Like people just, we're waiting for it to end to get on to the next thing. I think one thing they could do is is try to educate fans even on who Paul Ellering is, because I think it's awesome to see Paul Ellering on my TV in 2024, but I'm almost 50 years old, you know, and I watched the Road Warriors in their prime, and I think it might help if they explained who he was. I know that the uh, the tag team, those, those guys, they, they wanted... Ellering with them as part of their presentation. It was a condition, apparently, on their return to the company. They had asked for that. But I, I think they should explain why. Like, okay, these guys are ma managed by now, the who guy. Asked, did the company ask these guys, or these guys told the company they wanted Ellering? I had heard Which... that the, the tag team, and God, I can't remember, the, was Authors of Pain, is that the name? Okay, there's so many. AOP, -A but yes, Authors right. of Pain, but... It's uh, these tag teams now. It's everything is something of something. But the well, you know, you got who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third, but go ahead. Right. I'm not asking you who's on second. <laughs> exactly. But no, the, they had asked, I heard, the Authors of Pain, the AOP, to have Ellering with them. And that's why he's there. I could be wrong about that. I think that's great. But you want to educate people. Hey, guys, this is well, the yeah. guy who managed the Road Warriors. You know, that, give them a reason to care. Well, and uh, uh, Brian Last and I talked about this also uh, on one of the shows last week, but uh, Paul primarily, after the initial run, Paul was a, gr a great wrestling prospect uh, for, I guess, probably about four or five years, Precious Paul Ellering. He had, uh, he main evented in Tennessee as a heel. He main evented in Mid-South and in Georgia, and then had 
a couple of really bad knee injuries in a, in a row. And I mean, his physique, when he first came to Tennessee in 79, he was a bodybuilder. He looked big for Hawk and Animal. I mean, he wasn't like 300 and something pounds in his tall, but he was huge as far as his physique. And he had to drop a lot of weight. And because by then, Precious Paul had, a, had adopted a really good heel promo they said, well, Paul can talk. Let's make him a manager. He's hurt. And and that's where he ended up with Hawk and Animal. And they had a not only a professional relationship, but he was their shoot manager, not only in terms of, you know, their bookings and et cetera, keeping track of their transportation, but also he invested their money. And that was that when he carried the Wall Street Journal around in the promos, that was the fucking rib. That's what he was reading in the locker room. So, oh wow! Uh, but point being, after they were together for the first what was it two years, the Road Warriors had to become baby faces because they were so popular. Then Paul was limited as a manager in cutting promos because he had to be a baby face, right? And because the Hawk and Animal were so their personalities were so over the top, he took the back seat as he should have, because you had on a hat type of thing. He can't be outrageous, too. He's just kind of the the insidious one behind the scenes, right? So pointed that was a unique dynamic, and it didn't allow Paul to cut then the following decade of great memorable promos and for to be in all these highlight videos or whatever. So yes, to, your point is well taken. People don't remember great Paul Ellering promos. People don't remember Paul as the leader of numerous, you know, main event stars because he's he was identified with the Warriors and he was in that unique position. They were the hottest tag team at the box office in the business. He didn't want to change anything. But to establish him as a heel manager of anybody else, much less these two guys that I didn't see two tons of fun in, you have to do interviews, history packages, not only telling people who he was, but telling people what he wants to do now. Why is this near 70-year-old man right. out here with these guys? Does he have something that they're going to get for him? Or why is he beholden to them that he would do them this favor? Right. No, none of it. None of it makes sense. And even like if you the only way you'd even know that they were affiliated at all in the past was if you were watching NXT, because when they called them up to the main roster the last time a few years ago before they released them, Ellering didn't come with them. So he he was only with them in NXT. So so it's a pretty obscure thing. I just get the feeling when he comes out there, like you said, that there's this. No, I mean, I don't want this to sound like an insult. I mean, he's he's a small old man that's what he is but you see this little old man standing in front of a black background yeah. and you're thinking who the hell is this guy you know that's what i'm sure that's what young fans are thinking and again 44 years ago when i first met paul ellering he had a better physique than i would say all but maybe two or three people in the entire wwe today mm -hmm. but times change so what is the presentation now and what is he going to but it's Point is, I was going to make is that's what they could do with Paul. But besides that, the cause is lost to begin with because Karrion Cross and Scarlett, the, this is the WWE's black holes of charisma. Mm. It takes two to tango. Where they're trying to set people up to make stars, right? But you have to also not only have the material, but pick the right people. And the ship has sailed on Karrion Cross. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody's going to. Scarlet's beautiful. She needs to be with somebody else doing something else. And Paul with the other two guys, I don't, I don't see anything about the, the other two guys that, I mean, they, they look like a smaller version of the Vikings, a fat tag team that can do shit. Well, they're already not using the Vikings. So anyway... That's, uh, I, I don't think the, I think the final Testament, the last chapter has probably almost been written. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yes. In the book of Corny.
Is that, if, if, folks, let me know if that needs to be a T-shirt. The Book of Corny. Uh, speaking of the Book of Haman, he still tried to book a partner. He was in the back frustrated. He's got his head in his hands. And in comes Purely Dreary. Uh, Letitia and Claudia. I can't remember what their fucking names are. And they've got the accents, and they offer their services. Uh, but then Paul says, I need one guy, and to face L.A. Knight and Randy Orton and fucking A.J. Styles. And all of a sudden, then, they they get the limber tail, as J.R. used to say, and they uh, start backing up and excusing their way out of it, and then they bid him adieu. This is... This gimmick, these guys... I don't think they can ever overcome it, and they don't really look particularly impressive to begin with. But this is a holdover from when Vince McMahon was around, and I hope that this stuff can be weeded out because there's no sense when you're when you have this many stars and you have guys at the top of the card that people are caring about. You want to keep it that way. Why have this fucking stupidity and silliness where some average person can point at your show and look and say, "Why do you watch that stupid shit?" And be right. And, you know, it's not, it's not necessary. Nobody's watching the show because this fucking fall to all. Why do they have to have anybody that just looks purely fucking stupid for no reason? <laughs> That's my thought for the day. That and should so be on a t-shirt right there. There you go. <laughs> Everything I just said for the last minute and a half. Just small print. <laughs> and people have to lean over and invade your space to read it. And so then Heyman goes and he finds Lashley and the Street Profits. And he tries to sell Bobby Lashley, you and the bloodline. And he said, the only way I want to see Roman Reigns is if I'm standing across the ring from him. And he walks off on Paul. And you know what I was thinking at that point, Brian Solomon? What? You know, I was thinking about poor Heyman at this point, overwrought, anxiety-ridden, stressed out, his whole world's falling apart. The bloodline, his meal ticket is going to be vaporized here just shortly. He's thinking, I got to plan ahead and try to figure out a way to save money on my wireless plan. Clearly. Because he's always having to call Roman Reigns, and who knows where the fuck Roman Reigns goes these days when he's not on SmackDown or Raw. He could be in the South Pacific. He could be in the South of France. He could be in... South Alabama, you never know. But that's why the Paul Heyman's wireless bill is so damn high, just like the rent. But now, if he would listen to this program, Brian, if Paul Heyman would take the words that we say to his heart, he could get a cell phone plan from Mint Mobile for only $15 a month when he buys a three-month plan. And you know Roman Reigns is going to last more than three months as a top guy, so he's going to have to be calling him at the end of every television episode. These things add up. You call Samoa talk for 15 minutes. Well, on some wireless plans, they'll charge you $279.48. That's what it says right here in this copy. Hmm. But Mint Mobile, it's all included because Mint Mobile is unlimited. That means you can call Cambodia and recite the Gettysburg Address, fuck Mint Mobile. They got to pay for it. You're only paying 15 bucks a month. Is this American Samoa that we're talking about? Because that well, might make a difference. Well, it could be communist Samoa. Okay. I don't know if they still have an enclave over there. And also, it's unlimited text and talk. So let's say you just want to sit there and let your thumbs do the walking as you harass and stalk some poor innocent female who may not even be aware that you have these intentions until you send her a manifesto about all the various ways that you would like to whisper sweet nothings in her ear. Yeah, it ain't nobody will cost you a thing. Mm. No, nobody. Well, maybe your dignity it might cost you. Well, but you already don't have any of that if you're doing that in the first place, do you? True. And That's true. The high speed data. Whatever kind of, let's say you need a question answered and you need it answered quick. How can I cure Aunt Fanny's crotch rot? Boom. They're going to give you the data in high speed, just instantly like that. And it's so you can ask as many questions as you want. Just talk to your phone. Put the phone in your hand and say, hey, Mint Mobile, answer me this. And they got to answer you unlimitedly. Data, talk, text, it all 15 bucks a month. 
You know, I had an Aunt Fanny. I, I don't think she had that particular. Well, I mean, she probably wouldn't have told me if she had that ailment or not. But I but I did have an Aunt Fanny. Well, I was about to ask if you did uh, investigate your Aunt Fanny's crotch on a regular basis to determine whether that of some oh. type of fungal infection. My it's poor Aunt, Aunt Fanny. Oh, may she poor rest Aunt in peace. Fanny. I'm sorry, Aunt Fanny. I'm sorry. She's dead and you're talking about this? Why would you talk to the, why would you tell the people that your poor dead Aunt Fanny had fungal infections in her taint? Well, I, I said had. That implied that I no longer have an Aunt Fanny, right? But oh, I, I thought that. you meant that she cured it. You mean she never cured it? I don't, I don't, I doubt she ever had it. But, had it yeah. to her grave, huh? It was a chronic condition. Well, nevertheless, oh, folks, we'll have Bent Mobile to your grave also, but 15 bucks a month, especially for you elderly people that don't plan to live too much longer. It's not going to cost you an arm and a leg, merely a, a life and a death. And right now, if you go to mintmobile.com slash JCE, you will be able to get your wireless plan set up and you'll cut it to 15 bucks a month from whatever you're paying now with these cut rate competitors, these cutthroat, these scam artists, these bullshit artists that want to charge you $279.48 for a call to South Samoa. No more of that. Call Samoa with impunity. Mintmobile.com slash JCE and get this new customer offer, your three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month. Some additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply, but not in Samoa. See Mint Mobile for details on that whole line of bullshit I just described to you. There you go. Well, nobody's done more for cell phones over the years than Paul Heyman, so he deserves some type of of a special deal. I mean, that guy has been that guy has been using a a, a cell phone. Oh, you're phone. telling me. <laughs> you're telling me how long Paul Heyman's been using a cell phone. Do you know what I would do if he hit me over the head with his cell phone right now? I would look at him and smile and bend over and fart in his general direction. Because hmm. these things are barely the size of a credit card. True. When he well, hit yeah. that fucking phone in 1988, it was the size of a fucking construction brick. And, the, and it was shaped in an odd fashion, and the antenna stuck out. And it busted me open from asshole to appetite. That's my story. I know. I'm sticking to it. I know. Well, that's what he's done. He's found a different way to use it. He always puts a cell phone in the mix. He's not going to attack anybody with a with an iPhone. That would be ill advised. But he's well, found but also, a way. Look at look at the state of him now physically. I mean, you know, well, he has to he has to have help in the mornings when they feed him his oatmeal with X lax. I really appreciate that Paul Heyman has in his later years turned into. Zero Mustel from the producers. I'm I'm really very oh, glad that that happened. Max Max B Alley Stock. Right. I'm wearing a cardboard belt. You know, I've 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 leaned toward Hitchcock, but now I can see I can see the Zero Mustel and in, in Paul E. It's it's very heartwarming to see him morphing into all these beloved entertainment figures in his That's in right. his elder years. He just needs a Gene Wilder to play off. And and I, I think it's the milk of magnesium is doing him good. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> uh, back to SmackDown though, because <sighs> I've I've got a. Are you sure? <laughs> well, no, I got. Oh, I got. I got. A, he's got a. He's got a puke. No, I've got to talk to my boy, my my young son, my 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 spiritual son, Austin Theory. Mm. Because remember, at the top of the program, they'd come out. Waller was going to have a match. Well, then they argued with uh, the Carmelo Hayes, and now it's going to be Austin Theory, Waller in the corner, the sublime and the ridiculous, against Carmelo Hayes. And it is no secret that I've been a fan of Austin Theories. And that was the one thing when Vince was around after he went mad that they were doing right was at least featuring Theory. I think that his in ring. And physical conditioning at, at this point in time, well, his, his in-ring is definitely better than Cena's was at this point in his game, comparable to Orton, conditioning better than Orton's early in his career and comparable to Cena. At their, at their OVW era, I saw these guys at the same level of development. This kid's 22, 23 years old. He's a prodigy with his work and his timing. And he knows how to bump and feed. 
And bumping and feeding is not just taking a bump for something and get popping right back up mm-hmm. to get hit again with no change in your physical uh, facial expression or body language. Bumping and feeding is getting hit with something and taking a bump. And it seems that your momentum propels you upward and staggering and you turn and your eyes, I'm shocked that boom, you're going to get hit again. And you take a bump a different way and you get and you feed, you leave your arm out if you need to be shot off or you leave something open if you're going to be drop kicked or whatever the timing. In, in terms of he doesn't just stand there, Austin Theory, and wait for some schlub to dive on him. He's distracted or he's staggering. He turns at the last minute. You see the shock and surprise on his face before he gets hit in the mush. He sells that. His, his in-ring work is smoother with the basics and with the right timing than almost anybody his age. I've, he's a prodigy, right? And he can talk. And he gets more confidence as he goes along. He's still a young man. He's grown the beard, so he's scruffed up a little bit. But he looks like an arrogant and an obnoxious and an egotistical prick. They would talk down to you or be the college jock or whatever. He's got an unlikable persona as a heel. And he's fairly glib, and hopefully he will get further progress verbally to the point where the, he'll be the ones that they let talk on his own instead of being given these scripted lines but he delivers them better than most people what he doesn't need to be doing because he's so much farther ahead on all the important aspects of the game verbally in-ring work conditioning visual appearance attitude facial expression he's a grinning expressive prick he doesn't need to be doing flippy do shit like every other goddamn trampoline cowboy and jack off. He's ahead of that. He's beyond them. And what did he do here? He did great stuff because he was working as himself. He's a worker. He's a pro wrestler. He's not a goddamn gymnast. And he doesn't need to be because he will be a money drawing. Main event level talent, not an indie goof in the middle. But he goes out and he has a match with Carmelo Hayes, who honestly does some good shit and is in shape and looks like an athlete and is probably going to be the description of an indie goof in the middle when all is said and done. And Theory tries to do flippy shit and nearly broke both their fucking necks and they had to stop the match again. Brian, is that two times in three weeks they've had to stop a live television match because people can't stay off their fucking heads? Yeah, that was surprising. I, I had to watch that a couple times because I wasn't sure, again, like whenever this happens, if that was the planned finish or what. It just, that's, no, uh, no obviously not. And they just stopped it right in the middle. And I guess they felt they needed to, but. Man, I it, and and to me, it, it always seems like the things that don't look that serious are the things that are the most serious. I couldn't even initially tell what happened, but I guess they. When you saw the together. replay, it it got yeah. clearer on the replay, didn't it? Right on the replay, yeah, the, their heads went together. I guess is what happened. Yeah, well, it, it, it what happened was uh, theory had caught the guy and he set him on the turnbuckle and he climbed up and he was going to do some kind of thing where he had a hold of Carmelo Hayes and theory's back is toward the middle of the ring. And he's going to sit down on the top rope and spring backwards and do what did the Spanish fly where they both do the fucking backflip over and land. And it's so preposterous looking that the guy's obviously cooperating. They ought to call it unzip my fly and blow me. If you believe this. And instead of doing the Spanish fly, did the Spanish flop and they didn't rotate far enough. And theory, the dangerous part was not that they bonked heads uh, when they landed, which they said both got facial contusions or whatever. Right. But the most dangerous part that didn't quite materialize was that Theory not only was landing on his head, but he was landing on his head with his neck bent to the side. And that was the and and it was one more inch of not going far enough over or whatever. And that could have been a whole lot worse. And the referee slides in immediately and says, ah, let's not do this anymore. 
Right. And again, it's flat as fuck. And in this case, it was a single match. I took them to task in the tag team match that the guys that won the match looked like, well, fuck, we didn't get to do all our shit. Rather, no, we won the match, right? <clears throat> and everybody said, well, that's because they didn't want to win that way. No, it's because they got their fucking performance interrupted and they were visibly pissed and they showed it. You always get pissed when something like that happens. You're not supposed to fucking show it is the deal. I know what I'm talking about when shit goes south, right? Instead of the people on Twitter. You're always pissed off. Don't show it. React like you would. If it was real, not, I didn't get to do my shit. But here, this was a single match, and everybody just had to stand around or lay around, and the doctor's checking everybody, and the announcer said, well, these things can happen. But... Uh, that's the thing. You've, you've got a future main event talent, almost broke his neck, trying to do shit that he doesn't need to do because he's a farther ahead of 90% of the guys his age, or in some cases is older, and doesn't need to fucking do backflips. And that happens and what, with a lot of guys like him now, though. Pe people, there are guys that don't need to be doing those kind of things, and they just somehow feel... I, I don't know what it is just to fit in or to match everyone else's style that they have to do things that they have no business doing. Well, uh, Brian Alvarez, the uh, organ grinder's monkey for Uncle Dave's organ, uh, openly said to Theory a couple of months ago, well, all the indie wrestlers are lapping you. They can do many more things than you're doing. You're working that boring old style. Coincidentally, Brian Alvarez is five and a half feet tall and 150 pounds and wrestles like Cheetah in a Johnny Weissmuller movie. And, th and, and that's the last thing Theory needs to listen to is bullshit like that. He's ahead of all these clowns. He's in the biggest company and he has all the tools that genetics, steroids, and fucking Dr. Frankenstein can't add on to any of these indie goofs and they're jealous. And if I had, having spent years at the top of the largest company in the world's training program, if I was going to give him some advice, I would say do everything you're doing in the ring and work even harder on your personality and get more glib and more fucking comfortable and more confident talking verbally and be a bigger smart ass and come up with different ways to piss the crowds off when you're in the ring, either verbally or physically with your actions, and find some different way and get rid of Waller anytime you can. Put Strychnine and his goddamn protein powder secretly in the locker room and keep doing what you're doing in the fucking ring and work your ass off. And your time will come unless you land on your head and break your fucking neck and they carry you out on a spatula. <sighs> anyway, that's my free advice to Austin Theory. Would you like to get back to the bloodline? The bloodletting is about to begin. Why not? Let's do it. Well, in the back, finally, there's Jimmy Uso, and he wants to know who Paul got. And Paul, you know, Paul, who'd you get for us? Who's it going to be, man? Who's it going to be? And Paulie said, I've interviewed every man in the locker room and no one is worthy. No one is worthy <laughs> of teaming up again yeah. with you people. Auditions are over. We're not going to take any more tryouts. <laughs> I've got full faith in you, Jimmy Uso, and Solo. I'm not worried. And Uso says, I'm worried. Yeah, they were and great I, here. I thought well, they were I great. I wrote at the time, this is ridiculous, but they're making it work. Right, because they're good. And not even just... Paul, I thought that Jimmy was good in this. I thought Solo, you know, doing what he does as yeah. being the, the man of few words. Not a lot of people could pull it off like what you're saying, what Heyman was doing, where he was saying, that's it. No one's worthy of you guys. There aren't, not everyone would be able to pull off that kind of, of kind of, uh, you know, chicanery of, of two-facedness. Right? He's so good at being that two-faced kind of, I'm going to just you know, make you think one thing. And not everybody could do that. Well, and, and, and they play to his it. strengths. Let's face it. They have, 
It, start, it may have started years ago as a rib, but Paul has embraced it. They've made his inside the wrestling business reputation slash persona from ECW. His current one where he is out for himself, he's weaselly and conniving, and he'll bullshit everybody to get them to manipulate them to his will, and then he'll tell the other person the exact opposite, the whole nine yards. And now he has made this his gimmick, and it's an art form, and he's brilliant. And that's, you know, that's the old, who was it? I can't remember who it was, but one of his guys in ECW called him up. One of the main event guys, might have been Bubba Ray, somebody, said, Paul, where's my fucking plane ticket? I FedExed it. Well, what's the tracking number? Uh, 5496427532753. And he said, well, that's that's too, too many numbers. And Paul said, well, just take the last two off. <laughs> and hung up on him. <laughs> but anyway, so Paul says, I'm not worried. And Uso's like, I'm worried. And Solo says, I'm not. And then, then Jimmy says, well, if Solo ain't worried, I'm not worried. And you know they got to have something up their sleeve. And sure enough, Immediately, there's Randy Orton's entrance, and within 15 seconds, they've jumped Randy Orton in the aisle way, and they've Samoan spiked him, and the referees come out, and the heels go to the rig, and we go to a break in like one minute. Just, oh, shit, Orton's fucked. And this is the only thing I didn't like about this deal, because this has been, over this show, not only a show-length storyline thread, whatever you want to call it, but it's been wrestling. It's been wrestling, the fucking authority figure that Tony Khan ought to have. Nick Aldis was available, by the way, for the past few years. At some point, if Tony Khan needed an authority figure, which he sorely does, all these people were available, or at one time were Tony's. But you've got the authority figure making a match. The heels are trying to fucking get out of it. And then they're going to commit heelish acts against the baby faces who are going to have to retaliate. This is wrestling. Yes, some of the other shit's preposterous and or in the middle is filler. But with the stars and the top guys, you're understanding this. And everybody in their, in their role is performing it well. And it's not illogical or just goofy and crazy. You can follow this shit, right? Except... They come back from the break after they've jumped Orton and they recap, well, here's what just happened. And the heels are standing in the ring and they play AJ's music. And he comes out, even though he waits in the, in the, in the floor, in the aisleway until a LA Knights music plays. Now he comes, these heels have just jumped Randy Orton and beat him up. Where was LA Knight and AJ? <laughs> the referees came out. The, the security came out. Why did his partners come out? Oh, they were they making sure their music, music was queued up. Yeah, they they they're not you know they don't get activated until their music starts. They're like androids or something. Uh, it's, it's, I mean that was the the lapse in this. In again, if a Bill Watts or an Eddie Graham or a Dusty Rhodes or whatever, there would have been AJ and LA checking on Randy Orton as soon as the damage happened in the aisleway and the heels go to the ring right. and then the fucking baby faces say fuck you guys and jump in. But they've got to do their breaks. They got to do their entrances to fill their network time. And there's also the unspoken. There's that unspoken thing that it's one of those things that I guess people just say, "Well, it's wrestling," because you ha you can have these guys like Orton who, when they're in the ring, you can shoot them with like a bazooka, you know, and, and they'll get up two seconds later. But if you jump them in the aisle, you know, and hit them in the throat with your thumb, then forget yeah. it. They're out. They're they're absolutely done out. They have to be taken out of the match. You know, but obviously it was all set up for Orton but, to make his triumphant, you know, return mid-match. You know what phrase I never heard when I got into business and for 15 years after that, maybe? It's wrestling. Right. A lot right. of even the guys now that have been around for a while, ah, it's wrestling. I guarantee you, Bill Watts, when giving me a finish, never said if I called out that there was something that might be illogical or some loophole or something, he never said, ah, it's wrestling. No, and, and, and no, but anyway, nevertheless. So here comes AJ and here comes LA Knight. And then they finally, when they're both there, they get in the ring and now it's AJ and LA against Solo and Uso. Where are Comorato and a go-go when you need them? And AJ and LA Knight are arguing with each other 
about who's going to start or whatever because they're reluctant partners and the, the heels jump them from behind and start getting some heat on them and make them have to come back out from under it. And nobody says this. This may be an unpopular opinion. And I think the world of them is personalities. But neither one of the Usos is smooth. The Usos are not classically trained work. Neither one of them is Brad Armstrong, is what I'm trying to say. They are, they look like they might might be awkward to work with at some points. And I don't remember ever looking forward to Uso's matches, just what is Uso going to do or say, or whose side is whichever Uso going to be on, but not, wow, I can't wait to see that fucking match. Am, am I being too critical? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, they're, they're where they're at for a reason. I, I, I like them. I think they've, they've, God, they've been around so long. I think they may have, well, they're not a tag team anymore, but I think they have some kind of a record. You know, you could almost say that about a large carbuncle on your neck. <laughs> right. ah, I don't like it. It's been around for so long. It doesn't really, but I've got used to it. I mean, they're, they're good. I, I enjoy their matches. They're not terrible. I wouldn't call them one of the best working teams in the business at any point. They've had a lot of longevity, and they're they're fairly good at what they do. That's my ringing endorsement. <laughs> well, it, is the longevity because of lack of uh, competition in the field anymore? But nevertheless, so the baby faces fight up and beat up the heels for a couple minutes, and they go to the break in two minutes. Even the main event break in two minutes. But when they came back. They basically go into it. It's a, it's, this was a storyline set up and there's nothing wrong with that because their storylines are landing. They're, right. they're registering with people, but AJ finally went for the tag. They got the heat going on him, but solo had pulled LA Knight to the floor and LA Knight dealt with him, ran him into the stairs, whatever, and goes back to the corner after AJ's already been pulled back and, can't tag him so now aj gets free and sees him again and he's pissed and won't tag him he's going to stand there in the middle of the ring and argue with him about where the fuck were you and then uso goes to super kick aj from behind but aj ducks it and uso super kicks la knight off the apron unfortunately for him where he's going to have to sell for the next fucking two minutes or so from one kick and then AJ and Uso have the double knot.